Amen. 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 So this morning, of course, is St. Patrick's Day. So there's really only one. Am I right about that? It is St. Patrick's yeah. Day, right? Okay. Good. Otherwise, I really would have ruined the sermon, right? <laughs> we could have still preached it, but the, they would have ruined the title because the title is The Sin of St. Patrick's Day. The Sin of St. Patrick's Day. And really, there's only one topic to preach on, uh, you know, one subject that really we need to address on a day like St. Patrick's Day, and that's the subject of, of uh, alcohol, of drinking, of being a drunk. You know, and it's something that you kind of have to preach on from time to time. Uh, you know, I, I don't suspect anybody in here is, a, is an alcoholic or a drunk or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, it could be possible that maybe one day if we didn't preach on these subjects, if we didn't bring these things up, if we didn't remind ourselves of the evils of alcohol and how strongly the Bible condemns alcohol, that we could slip back into being a drunk or maybe start drinking. We, you know, there, none of us here is above falling into some sin, even a sin as, uh, such as alcohol, as drinking and getting drunk. So I want to preach this morning about the sins of St. Patrick's Day. And one of the first things we have to understand is that St. Patrick's Day is not a Christian holiday. You know, if you go look it up on Wikipedia like I did, they'll, they'll keep saying it was uh, St. Patrick was a Christian who went to Ireland and evangelized Ireland and did all these things. Well, it's true that he went to Ireland and he evangelized Ireland, but he did it in the name of the Catholic Church. Yeah. You know, and even and it's it's crazy that that you would uh, you know we're getting to the point now where even Catholics you know they're they're calling themselves Christians. But, you know, if we were to go knock some of these neighborhoods just behind where we're, we're located now, where there's a lot of old school Catholics. You know, they don't you ask them, hey, are you a Christian? They say, no, I'm a Catholic. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's the world that wants to kind of blur that line. So I just kind of want to touch on that first of all, to not get this idea that just because someone puts the word saint in front of somebody's name, that it's necessarily a Christian thing that they're celebrating. It's actually a Catholic origin is where uh, St. Patrick's Day comes from. And I don't want to go on too much about who St. Patrick was and what he did and all that. It's not really the point of the sermon. But St. Patrick's Day, what the big sin of St. Patrick's Day is, is the fact that it's a day of drunkenness. It's a day of drunkenness. And drunkenness is a very serious sin. It's a sin that God judges uh, countries over, I believe. It's, it's a sin that's often associated with a lot of other sins. It's one of those sins that if we let creep into our life, it's going to cause us to commit a lot of other sins. And we're going to see that here as we get into the scripture, that when you become a drunk, there's often a lot of other sins that creep into your life and cause you to even go further into sin than maybe you, uh, you know, had first intended to, uh, to, to, to do. You know, you say, hey, I'm just going to drink a little bit, uh, you know, and that's it. Well, it might lead into a lot of other things. You know, it might lead you going to places to get that drink that you shouldn't be going. Right. Or there's other sins going on that you'll start to partake in. And alcohol can really ruin your life. And, you know, my plan this morning is just kind of talk about this very, you know, just very bluntly and kind of share some of my experience. You know, I'm, unfortunately, I did not grow up in a Christian home. And I don't want to come across as one of these guys that says, you know, you know, I, I know so much more about sin because I lived a life of sin. I'm not trying to glorify sin. You know, would to God that I'd grown up in a Christian home. I envy the man that has the testimony that says, I've never tasted alcohol. Amen. Amen. You know, because that man has never had to, to deal with any of the effects of alcohol in his life or in his family. You know, so I, I'm not trying to get up here. And when I start to share some of my own personal experiences, you know, I'll, I'll kind of judge as I go how much I decide to share. I'm not trying to glorify myself or come across that I, you know, you should... Uh, you know, think, think something of me because I pulled myself up out of some gutter. You know, I, I didn't do any of that. It was the Lord, you know, who gave Amen. me his spirit, gave me the strength and the power and, and the conviction of his Holy Spirit and his word to, to, to want to get uh, sober and, and live a clean and godly life. So all glory goes to him Amen. this morning for anything that I share about my own testimony. But let's just get right into here where it says in Isaiah chapter 5, look at verse 11, it says, now before I even read this verse, I want you to look at the very end of the verse and notice how that... Uh, sentence is punctuated. It's not a period. It's not a question mark. It's an exclamation point. Whenever you see an exclamation point, you know, something's being said very emphatically. Something's being said with very great strength. And God is trying to stress this point here. And what is it that he's stressing there in verse 11? It says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, to wine and flame them. He's saying very emphatically, woe to the person that's going to get up and drink alcohol and continue to drink all day until wine inflame them. He's saying, woe unto the person that would consume alcohol. And that's exactly what's going on today on a day like St. Patrick's Day. You know, there's a lot of people today that are getting up this morning 
Oh, and they're getting dressed. And they're putting on their attire for, to celebrate the day. But it's not to come to the house of God. It's not to celebrate, uh, uh, you know, uh, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It's not to partake in the preaching of God's word. It's not to go out and knock doors. It's to get up and go and drink all day yeah. and then continue on until wine inflame them. Yeah. They're getting on. They're putting on their stupid green hats and their stupid green beads and green everything else and stop talking with a dumb Irish accent, and they're going to go bar hopping in every city across this country and drinking until wine and flame them. That's what's going on today, Amen. and that is the sin of St. Patrick's Day. Yep. And that's what we see going on all across our nation. And when we read this chapter, if you're paying attention, as Brother Garza read this chapter this morning, you would notice that God is not very pleased with the children of Israel at this point. Yep. And why is it? Well, a lot of it is because they were a bunch of drunks. And I'm telling you, this country today has become a nation of drunks. We have a lot of drunks, and alcohol is being glorified and lifted up and promoted and taught that it's cool and taught that it's okay and that it's something that you can do and that God won't, ma won't even bat an eye at it. But he says here, woe unto them. Not only because you're incurring God's wrath, not only because you as a Christian who goes out and partakes in that sin are incurring God's wrath, but because of just the effects that being a drunk bring on it in and of itself. Yep. You know, there's certain things that are going to take place in your life if you're one who decides to drink on a regular basis and get drunk. There are very uh, things that could happen that are just devastating to your life. Very pot uh, potentially things that could happen that are just terrible. And we see people that are suffering all the time in our country uh, because of alcohol. And I do want to kind of go over, you know how I love to get facts and statistics and read them to you and hopefully they don't come off as too dry. But they should be kind of sobering and they should cause us to pay attention and, and realize that the Bible is true when God says, woe unto them yep. that, get, that drink, woe unto them that rise up early that they may follow strong drink. Now here from the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, I want to read just a few things from this. It says here an estimated 88,000 people die from alcohol-related causes annually. That's nearly 100,000 people. That's 88,000 people every year that are gone from the face of the earth because of alcohol. Because of one thing, alcohol. That's what takes them out. You know, and I wonder how many of those people were saved. How many of those people knew the Lord? Maybe a fraction? Did they know God when they... They decided to go out and get drunk when they wanted to and get behind the wheel of a car and, and, and kill themselves or somebody else? Did they know God when they drank themselves to the point that their liver became scarred and inflamed and burst and they died a slow and painful and agonizing death? But that's where we're at in this country where we have 88,000 people dying every year. And you say, well, what's the big deal? You know, why, why do you got to get on it? Because there's days like today called St. Patrick's Day where, where getting drunk and being a drunk is glorified, it's lifted up, it's promoted, and people are dying in tens of thousands. And we need people to stand up and say, no, it's not right. Yep. No, it's wicked. It's going to ruin your life. It's going to kill you. That's right. The Bible says in 2014, or not the Bible, I always do that, but the, the report here says in 2014, alcohol impaired driving fatalities accounted for 9,000 967 deaths. So that 88,000, you might as well just go ahead and throw another 10,000 deaths on top of it for all the people that go out and get drunk and get behind the wheel of a car and crash into somebody or into some telephone pole or into some tree or go careening off some cliff somewhere or into some ditch and they get killed in a car accident. You say, well, how often does that kind of thing happen? Well, I don't know. I know one person that I went to high school with. That's exactly how he met his end. He went out, got drunk at some party, got in his pickup, went down the road, hit a telephone pole, and his car burst into flames. And the only thing that they could say that was good about it was that he was probably dead by the time the fire got to him and burned him to the point where they couldn't even have an open casket at his grave. So I'm telling you. You think that it's just a little fun. You think that it's just a good time on St. Patrick's Day. You don't know what that drink's going to do to you. Right. You don't know how far that alcohol is going to take you and what effect it can have. Amen. You know, a lot of times the only thing we can get across to people is when we start to talk about their money. When we start to get after them about, you know, how it's going to affect your wallet. A lot of people, they don't mind about all, all the people that are dying. But when you start to talk about money, boy, their ears perk up. And they say, well, let's, let's hear about that. Well, in, in 2010, alcohol misuse cost the United States 
$249 billion. You know, Trump wants to build his wall and he's having a hard time funding it. Well, why doesn't he just ban alcohol and save $250 billion and he can go build this stupid wall, right? He's so worried about getting all this money for this wall or whatever else they want to put it into. You know, why don't they take that $249 billion that they're spending on alcohol and give it to some other cause that would actually help people instead of having to waste all this money? In 2012, 3.3 million deaths globally, or 5.9% of all global deaths, nearly 6%, were attributed to alcohol consumption. 3.3 million people in one year died because of alcohol. You know, we would, if, we, if we were to just go somewhere and just wipe out the half, of the half of Phoenix, that's about 6 million people right there, just in one year, just wipe out half a city like Phoenix, they would probably say, what caused this? How did this happen? we got to fix this. But it happens all the time. It happens every year. Yeah. Where millions of people are just gone from the face of the earth because of something like alcohol. More than 10% of U.S. children have a parent with alcohol problems, according to a 2012 study. Now you say, well, that's only 10%. Yeah, but maybe that 10% is living a life that they shouldn't have to live. They're living a, you know, a, 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 just a downtrodden life, just a life of having to see their parents be drunk. And let me tell you something. I'm going to get a little personal here right now because I'm somebody who grew up in a house of drunks. I'm somebody who had to watch my dad drink. I'm somebody who had to watch my mother drink. I remember as a little boy having to, my mother was a waitress, and I'm not trying to put them down. You know, they're not saved. They're, they were people that just of the world. They were just following the course of this present world. They were just the children of disobedience doing what comes naturally to them. But I'm trying to express to you that this is a reality, that when I just read these facts, these aren't just numbers. These are actual people. These are 10% of living, breathing children that are having to live with drunks in this country. Right. And I remember having to go and being taken by my mother, and, and she would take us to a, a Windows in Rapid City, South Dakota. It was one of the ta ta taller buildings up there. And she worked at Windows, which is this real fancy restaurant. And she was a bartender, and she was a waitress. And I grew up around this stuff. I grew up going helping to clean the restaurant, going up to the bar after or before opening hours, and eating the little maraschino cherries on those little swords, and stabbing and eating right out of the bar. And I remember my dad taking me out into the garage when I was six years old and taking a little cup and having me stand around the keg with all the other guys and giving me a little drink of alcohol so I could feel like one of the, like one of the men. You know, and giving me a taste for alcohol at such a young age. That's what starts to happen to these 10% of children that grow up in a house where parents have alcohol problems, where they're drunks, where they're alcoholics, whatever you want to call it. You know, and that didn't do me any good. I grew up in a, and, and, and ended up... Of course, naturally, when you develop a taste for alcohol at such a young age, it's going to come natural to you. And when you see the people that are supposed to be setting an example for yeah. you drinking alcohol, of course, it's just going to come naturally to you to want to drink alcohol when you get to be of age. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah. Did a lot of drinking in my younger years. I don't, you know, didn't do me any good. Being arrested, having to go to jail, being on probation. You know, it was a lot of pain and heartache and stupidity and sin and things that I wish I had never done or heard or seen or said, all because of alcohol. That's right. And today, people are going to get up on St. Patrick's Day yeah. and celebrate this when it's absolutely ruined people's lives. You know, I'll never, remember, I'll never forget the time I woke up one morning and my dad said, come on, son, we got to go and, and, and make some rounds. And I don't know where exactly we went, but we went and saw his friend and he was bragging to all his buddies about he was out at the bar one night and got his teeth knocked out. He had his two front teeth knocked out in a bar fight. Got drug out back, had some ribs broken, and thought it was cool. I remember going to the dentist with him, having to wait in the dentist's lobby while my dad had some, some fake teeth made for him. Is that what you want for your life? Is that what you want for your kids? To have to, to be a drunk? To be somebody that's going to, you know, uh, you know, get violent at the home, go out and, and actually try to pick a fight with a man for once and get his, his, his backside handed to him? I don't want that for my life. I don't want that for my kids. And that's why I'm preaching a sermon like this today on a day like today, St. Patrick's Day, when people are, good, are getting up and going out and drinking and thinking there's nothing wrong with alcohol. There's everything wrong with alcohol. Yeah, right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me tell you, it's, it's wicked. It's evil. Yeah, amen. It's ruining our country. There's a lot more to this report. We could go on and on. I won't, I've just highlighted a few points here. I'll read to you. To try and drive this point home. Because people, they just hear it from the Bible and they just think, well, yeah, but that's an old book and doesn't really know what they're talking about. That's just some, 
you know, fired up preacher up there who just, you know, has to get up and rip, up, rip on alcohol because it's expected to him. Well, let me just give you some more facts. I mean, we already read about the 3.3 million people that die annually, globally, from alcohol. We already read about the near 10,000 people that have died in the U.S. alone because of alcohol. But drinking alcohol can have extreme effects on your health. It can have terrible effects on your health. This should be a no-brainer. I mean, I could tell you, I, I, I know of at least three people that I knew in my life. I wasn't real close to them, but I knew who they were. I knew their names. That they went out and they literally drank themselves to death. Got cirrhosis of the liver. Have you ever seen about somebody with the cirrhosis of the liver? Yeah. Their stomach expands. It's blown up. Everything else is skinny, but the stomach looks like they're about... You know, eight or nine months pregnant, you know, they've just got this huge gut, and it's their, it's their liver. People that have been, you know, just drinking their whole lives, ruining their liver, and, they, and the doctor will tell them, if you continue to drink, you will die. And they keep drinking. Yep. That's how powerful alcohol is. Yep. So people need to think about that before they don their St. Patrick's Day apparel and go out there and think it's just going to be a day of fun. You know, it's just going to be a, it's going to be like New Year's. You know, it's just going to be like... Uh, Thanksgiving. It's just going to be like Christmas. It's just going to be a little bit of drinking. It's just going to be the 4th of July. You know what it'll turn into? It's just going to be Friday night. Yep. It's just going to be Saturday night. I mean, you know, think about the fact that they're taking the time to get up this morning and go out and drink on a Sunday. You know, Sunday is usually when they're trying to, 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 to walk it off the night before. But, you know, St. Patrick's Day turns into one holiday. One holiday turns into two holidays. Two holidays turns, well, it's just a couple times a week. Just a couple times a month, turn it'll turn into every single day. Yep. Right, amen. Happens all the time. Yep. Every drunk starts out taking his first sip. Yep. Every drunk that's laying in the gutter in his own, you know, filth and vomit, and is is laying there. He was somebody's baby. He was somebody's little boy. He was somebody's little girl. You know, it was somebody who somebody cared about. But one day, one day he said, "You know what? I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe the preacher." I don't think that's true. And started drinking. And it reached out and got a hold of him. And now he's a drunk today. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. Excessive alcohol use led to approximately 88,000 deaths <coughs> and 2.5 million years of potential life lost. I mean, if you were to add up all the potential lifespan, the average lifespan of all the people that died to, to alcohol, if you added it all up, it'd come out to 2.5 million years. That's a lot of life. That's a lot of things. You, how much could you get done with 2.5 million years? Probably get a lot done, right? That's a, that's a waste. It's a waste of potential. Who knows, who knows what those people could have done if they hadn't got hooked on alcohol, if they hadn't been given that drink as a little boy, if they hadn't been given that drink as a young girl, if they hadn't been given that drink as a teenager at some party somewhere, if they hadn't gone into that bar or that club that one night. Excessive drinking was responsible for 1 in 10 deaths among working age adults, 20 to 64 years old. 1 in 10. 1 in 10 deaths. And as for, you know, it goes on. We won't read all that. Let's get into the Bible because the Bible is the one that matters. Amen. The Bible is the one that's going to bring the conviction, you know, conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yep, right. The Bible is going to one that should be the one that convince you, not just these facts. This, these facts are just showing us the Bible's true. Yep, right. This is what happens when a nation casts off God. This is what happens when a nation no longer wants to listen to the precepts of the Word of God and thinks alcohol is okay. When they have days like St. Patrick's Day, days like New Year's Day, when they think, hey, well, it's a certain day of the year. It's no, it's no problem being a drunk today. Just drinking to excess. You know, I lived in a city back in Michigan. I, I remember St. Patrick's Day. We hung out downtown as teenagers. We'd be skateboarding down there. And you knew when it was St. Patrick's Day because all the bars were down there. And you'd just see these drunks, just roving bands of drunks, just stumbling through the street trying to get to the next bar and they'd start it they'd be, we'd be down there after school and they'd already be drunk they'd been down there since 12 o'clock yep people get hooked on alcohol you have no idea how, how far to take you you'll find yourself drinking first thing in the morning mm -hmm. i remember being out on a job site way out in the boonies in michigan somewhere and we had to get some some i needed something to drink not some alcohol some water or something and there was one place to get it and it was in a bar and i said you know i don't want to go in there but man i need to get a drink not, not like that. That sounded really bad. I need to get some water, yep. right? So I went in there, and I opened the door, and I'm thinking, surely there's nobody in here. No one's going to see me. My, my boss was, was with me. He was waiting in the pickups. I hurry up, get in there, get, see what they got, and get back out. we got to get back to work. Was our, we were on a lunch break. So I opened up the door, and sure enough, just old, shriveled-up men in that smoky, dark, 
bar, yep. curled up over that bar on that on that that bar stool, sitting there drinking. Ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, noon, already at it. That's right. Yep. It's a shame. That's right. It's terrible to sit there and watch people waste their lives on this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would say, oh, the heroin addict, oh, the the pothead, oh, the the cokehead, and say all these other terrible drugs that people can get addicted to, and yet we'll just we won't even think twice about alcohol. Right. Yeah. You know, we'll just go down to the store and buy it. We'll just go down to the store and partake. We'll just go to the whatever get together and say oh, it's just a couple of drinks. No big deal. It's a big deal. The Bible condemns it. You're there in Isaiah chapter 5. You read verse 11 where it says, One, and then they rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue to until night till wine inflame them. The harp and the vial and the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feasts. Man, that sounds just like a bar. It sounds just like the club. It sounds just like St. Patrick's Day. It sounds just like New Year's Day. A good time. It's a good time while you're, while you're there with all your friends before it starts to really get a hold on you until it gets to be about two three o'clock in the morning and you can't walk straight and you're sick and the world's spinning it says the harp the vial the tabret the pipe and wine are in their feast but they regard not the work of the lord neither the operations of their hands of his hands therefore are my people gone into captivity why are they going into captivity because they regard not the work of his hands why don't they regard not the work of his hands because they're getting drunk you know, the drunk only cares about one thing, getting drunk. He's not worried about God. You know, all the people that you, let, let, let's go down to the bar uh, scene here in Tucson and try to witness to the people that are bar hopping today. You think they're going to give you two seconds of their time? No. Get out of the way, you Bible thumper. I'm trying to get to my whiskey. I'm trying to get to my beer. I'm trying to get to my liquor. They don't want to hear about God. They don't want to hear about the works of his hands. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen? They're going to go into captivity. In this life, they're going to be potentially taken by the bondage of sin and held to it, maybe become drunks if they're not already, and they might just disregard so God so much to the point, disregard every opportunity they have to hear the gospel, that after a life of drinking and partying, they just go straight to hell. Mm -hmm. That's a shame. It's sad. It says there in verse 14, Therefore hell, hell, hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. Oh, they're rejoicing today. They're having such a good time with all their music and their feasts and their drinking. But they regard not God. They cast off the Lord. They don't listen to the preaching of the word of God. And they descend into hell. Let's go ahead and turn over to Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 20. I mean, you don't know how far alcohol can take you. You don't know how far being a drunk can take you. I've known people that have been hooked to a lot of drugs, but they never got off alcohol. And let me tell you something, they weren't any better of a person just because they got off coke. They weren't any better of a person just because they quit smoking pot. You know, if they got clear of all of it, it would have been pretty, they probably would have been all right. But they held on to that one thing that everyone's just okay with, being a drunk. Yep. You no, know, it's okay for you to just sit down and have a 12-pack of Coors Light every night. After work. Yeah, it's legal. It's condoned. As long as you're 21, you know, go to the casino, we'll give it to you for free. No problem with it. How are you getting home? We don't care. But you know, alcohol will take you to some strange places if you're not careful. I mean, it can take you into the weirdest places. When I was talking, uh, Brother Kiefer coming down here about, about some of my past, and I told him how, how I was living down on the islands. You know, I worked in a bar for a little while. I'm not proud of that. I wish I'd never done it. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to get up here and glorify myself or you know, try to come across as I'm cool or something because I got some past. I wish I'd never done it. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. I'm very, I, I dodged a bullet. Who knows where I could have ended up? Yep. Fortunately, I saw a couple guys drink themselves to death in that bar, and that's what woke me up to it. That's why I said, this ain't the place for me. This isn't what I want for my life. You know, I was there. I was there in that bar, and you know what? It's, this is, this, it's the truth, and I'm just going to say this because, you know, I want some of you to hear this, and you kids need to pay attention. Alcohol will get you around the worst kind of people there are. That's right. right. You go in these bars, you are you're going to be rubbing elbows with the worst kind of people. Right. Sodomites. Yep. Sodomites. Where do you think they hang out? The bar. Right. How do I know? Because I've been in these bars, not not a sodomite bar. I've been in a, a straight bar, as they would call it, where where at least halfway normal people would show up. But the sodomites, they come in there too. Yeah, that's right. And I've had them offer me a drink. And I, I wasn't saved. 
And, but I knew well enough right then what they were and what they were into. I said, no thanks. I'll go drink my own drink way over here. <laughs> but he was there. They were there. What if I had taken that drink? What if they put something in that drink? Yeah. What could have happened? Listen as I read from Habakkuk chapter 2. You're there in Proverbs 20. I'm going to read to you from Habakkuk chapter 2. It says here, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, and that puttest thy bottle to him, and maketh him drunk, and makest him drunk, and also that thou may lookest on their nakedness. This is a man, if you paid attention here, it's a man giving another man a drink so that he can look on his nakedness. The Bible is being very delicate here about the situation, but there's nothing going on that's good. This is, this is a guy who wants to do some pretty wicked stuff. This is a guy who's into some really sick, perverted things. Trying to get somebody else drunk and take advantage of them. And that's what happens. I mean, we hear all the time about, you know, the, the, the date rape and all these other things. The, 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 the young lady goes out to the club just trying to have a good time with her friends. Meets some cute guy. She thinks he's, he's nice looking. He buys her a drink, puts something in it, and she, and she gets raped. Yep. Terrible things happen, people, because of alcohol. Right. I don't like talking about it, but it's reality. That's right. And someone's got to talk about it because today we're celebrating it. People are getting up today and they're going to go out and get drunk all day. And they're going to wake up tomorrow and go to work like nothing happened. Well, hopefully this doesn't happen. Hopefully something like this doesn't go on. Stuff like that goes on. You think about these college campuses, how much this kind of all stuff time. goes on. It goes on. The Bible says there in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, Wine is a mocker, a mocker Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You know, if you're here when I'm preaching this morning, you think I'm just over the top. You think I'm just blowing off with some steam up here. You think whatever. You know what? There's nothing wrong with alcohol. Let me tell you something. You're deceived this morning. You're deceived if you think that wine isn't a mocker. You're deceived this morning if you think that strong drink isn't raging. That's what the Bible says. If you think there's nothing wrong with it, you're deceived. Amen. You're not wise. You need to wise up. You need to get some smarts. You know, kids need to understand this. Amen. You know, I preach this most of all for the kids. Amen. They're the ones that need to hear this kind of preaching. And be warned about the dangers of alcohol. And here's some actual testimonies about what it can do to a person's life. The Bible says there, go over and turn over to uh, Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 4. The Bible says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes to drink strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any that be afflicted. Any of the afflicted. You know, that's a big problem with, we have with our rulers today. That's a big problem that we have over in Washington is they're a bunch of drunks. You wonder why our government is so corrupt? You wonder why, why people can just uh, go in there and just make laws that are contrary to the Constitution, that they can just take bribes. Everybody's bribed. Everybody's corrupted up there in that den of thieves called Washington, D.C. I tell you, it's because they're a bunch of drunks. Yep. Right. They're a bunch of rulers that have been drinking, and they have forgot the law, and they pervert judgment yep. of any of those, of any of they that be afflicted. That's what's going on up there goes on and says in verse 6, it says, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. Oh, so here's where the Bible condones drinking, right? This is where it's okay. The Bible says give strong drink to him that is ready to perish. Yeah, go ahead, give strong drink to the guy that's already wasted his life, that has already ruined his liver, ruined his testimony, you know, lost every job he ever had, has no money, down and out, in the gutter, there's no hope for him, just give him to drink, he's ready to perish anyway. Put him out of his misery. That's what it's saying. I mean, is that is that how you want to get to the place where it's okay to drink alcohol? Well, I'm ready to perish, so the Bible says it's okay. I mean, is that really what you want for your life? And of course, we understand the Bible's not actually saying that this is okay. He's just making the point that, you know, the only person that you should even think about giving alcohol is somebody who's ready to just die. Give strong drink to him that is ready to perish, and wine to them that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. I don't want I don't want to not forget I don't want to forget my misery. I don't want to have misery. Yep. That's 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 the difference. I don't want to be a miserable person. I want to sit there and drown my sorrows in alcohol. You know, I don't want to have a tear in my beard. I don't I just don't want any tear. And I don't want any beer either. Right. <clears throat> 
Now you say, well, that's, that's applying to kings only. Keep something in Proverbs. Turn over to Revelation chapter 1. Well, it says that it's not for kings. It's not for kings. It's not for people who are in leadership. People who have to have discernment and be wise. 21 or 1? Uh, Revelation oh, chapter 1. Oh. Revelation chapter 1. You know, it's not for the pastor. He's the one that shouldn't drink. And it's not for the deacon. The Bible says he shouldn't drink. Well, let's see what the Bible says are kings today. Who does God look down on earth and call kings today? It says there in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, of him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings Amen. and priests unto our God and his father. You know, if you're saved today, God looks down and says, you're a king. That's right. He looks down and says, you're a king. You're royalty. You are, you are a ruler among my people. So let me ask you someone. Since it's not for kings, it's not for you either. Yep. It's not just, you know, it's not just off limits to the pastor. It's not just off limits to the deacon. It's just not off limits to the rulers in our government. It's off limit to any born again Bible believer. Any born again child of God, as God has made a king, should not drink alcohol. Period. Ever. Mm -hmm. Not even a drop. That's my opinion. We'll right. get into that more. You're still there in Proverbs chapter 20. Go ahead and, or Proverbs 31. I want to read to you a little bit from 1 Thessalonians 5 where it says, Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Therefore, uh, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. The Bible says that we, as the children of light, are to be sober. You know, that means we're not supposed to be drinking alcohol. You know, we should be in the house of God on Sunday, not out, on, out there on St. Patty's Day, Amen. running around drinking, or any other day of the week. The Bible exhorts us over and over and over again as the children of light, as kings unto our God, to be sober. It's not just for the pastor. It's not just for those in leadership. Go ahead and turn over to first, uh, or turn over to Titus. Titus chapter 1. I love this book, this chapter in Titus, because it tells you exactly who it is that's supposed to be sober. Every single person is who it is. But over and over again, the Bible tells us, be sober, be sober, be sober. It says here in 1 Peter 5, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. If we're not sober, we're going to get devoured, the Bible says. I mean, how, much, how many more stories do I have to tell before we realize that alcohol it, it, you know, causes you not to be sober and opens you up to the attack of the devil? Yeah. That you'll get devoured by the devil if you decide to be a drunk. If you decide not to be drunk, so I'm not going to get drunk all the time. Look, one bad decision while you're drunk will ruin your whole life. Yeah, right. You know, when you think, well, I can just drink a little bit. You know, I only do it every so often. You know, you get drunk one time, you'll make one dumb decision that will ruin your whole life. You know, we're all just one bad decision away. Well, I'm just going to stop in the casino this one time. I'm just going to stop in this bar just this once. It's been years. It's been decades since I've had a drop. What's it going to hurt? Nobody's watching. Oh, it's just at this one family gathering. It's just one glass of wine. And, you know, one thing leads to another. One decision gets made, and your life is just ruined. Mm -hmm. Look at there in Titus. Let's see who's supposed to be sober. Titus chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober. So we see, first of all, that the bishop is to be sober, right? Look at, verse, uh, look at chapter 2. Go over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober. So we got two people now, right? The bishop and, of course, the aged men as well. And if we were to go over to Timothy, we, or 1 Timothy, we could read about where the deacon is supposed to be sober, not given to much wine either. So we got three people down, right? We're, we're, we're plucking them off one by one. You know, we're taking them down. These guys, no drinking so far. So if you're an aged man, if you're the bishop, or if you're the deacon, no drinking. So who else? Well, let's look at uh, uh, chapter 3. That the aged women likewise, that they may be in behavior as become as holy, holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober. Mm -hmm. So really, that's two right there. Because how are you going to teach somebody something that you aren't doing yourself? That's yeah. something you don't know yourself. 
So the aged women are supposed to be sober, and the young women too. Right? Yeah. We'll say, well, who, who does that leave? Well, the young men. Well, let's look at verse 6, where it says, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. That's everybody. That's every single one of us. We're all supposed to be sober. Amen. There's nobody in this room that can say, well, it's only for so-and-so. Or it's not for me, it's just for them. We're all supposed to be sober. Yeah. We should all want to be sober. You know, I, I enjoy being sober. Amen. I enjoy having a clear mind. Yeah. I enjoy not having to worry whether or not that person that wants to buy me a drink is a flaming faggot. Yeah. And was trying to take advantage of me. I enjoy not having to wake up in the yard at my own house, not knowing how I got there in my own vomit. I enjoy not having to lay down in my bed and have the room spin around me and wish it would stop and spin and spin and spin. I enjoy not having to wake up in the, the next morning and have a splitting headache and not knowing what happened the night before. Yep. I enjoy that. I enjoy being sober. Sober. Let me tell you something. If you need alcohol to have a good time, you're a loser. Amen. That's a fact. Yep. If you can't have a good time without getting drunk, you're a boring person and you're a loser. Yep. And you can like it or lump it. That's a fact. I tell you what, I've had some of the, the, be, the best fun, the, the, the best relationships, the, the best time with my friends, being sober, being with sober people. Right. And we can have just as good a time as anybody else. I've laughed harder, I've enjoyed myself more, and being sober than any, than any other time in my life. I, you can't even compare it. I don't care what kager you were at, I don't care what bonfire you were at, I don't care what frat house you were in, I don't care what club. It was nowhere near as good as the time I've had with sober friends. Amen. Because you know what? It was guilt-free. Yeah. There was no remorse. And there was no risk. There was no risk involved. You know, when Brother, Brother uh, Kiefer came down with me this morning, and he got in the van, he and his wife, to come down here with me. He didn't have to sit there and give me a breathalyzer. <laughs> I wonder whether or not I was going to take us careening off the 10 into some, you know, into some semi-truck coming in the other lane. You know, there was, there was a, did you feel a, a lot of risk this morning? You know, what if I had been drunk? What if I showed up and, you know, hey, brother, it's uh, time we're going to Tucson. You know, and I still, hey, I'm just, it was last night. I'm still walking. It's wearing off. You know? I was drunk. I'm not drunk. Right? He probably, if, you know, he's a smart enough guy. He'd say, you know what? I'll pass. You know, and you should, and by the way, we need to have a conversation with the pastor. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's a huge hypothetical, right? That's never going to happen. But hey, the point I'm trying to make here is that, we don't need to have alcohol to have a good time. Amen. We don't have to do that. We don't want to take the risk that's involved. Are you still there in uh, Proverbs chapter 31? Let me get over there myself. We'll, we'll wrap this thing up here. <clears throat> Oh, 23, I'm sorry, Proverbs 23. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 39. Bible reads here, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? I mean, I don't want it's, it's, I, We're just getting into this, these few verses here. I don't want any of this. I don't want woe. I don't want sorrow. Let me tell you something. I got enough sorrow from alcohol that I didn't even drink for my life. You know, and I'm sure if we went around the room and wanted to get real personal, we could probably, a lot of people could chat the same testimony. Mm -hmm. Because after all, we, we have children that are growing up in homes where there's drinking going on. We have people that are getting saved later in life that were, they were probably drinking before they got saved. You know, and, and we don't want woe. I, I don't. Who has sorrow? Plenty of sorrow to go around from alcohol. I remember that, that friend of mine in high school that, that died in that fiery wreck, going to his funeral and seeing the sorrow and the pain in, in, in his parents' eyes. I remember the dad coming to the, 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 the kid who had thrown the party. He was there at the funeral and saying, we're going to have a talk. You and I need to get together. I don't, I don't know what went on in that conversation. I, could keep, I can't imagine the guilt that you'd have to feel of sitting there pouring alcohol down your friend's gullet 
and then just watching him get in his truck and go down the road and get killed being drunk. Who hath sorrow? Who hath woe? Who hath contentions? Who's the one that goes out and gets his teeth knocked out in the bar fight? Mm -hmm. Who's the one that goes out and gets a bottle busted over his head, gets drug out in the alley and kicked in the ribs? Who is that? Who hath babbling? I can't stand being around drunks anymore. Yeah. I just can't stand it. Right. It's the most obnoxious group of people to ever be around. Mm -hmm. I want to get as far away from them as I can. I remember delivering pizza when I got here. I had to go to some hotel, and there was a bunch of just some, I don't know, some stupid convention going on. I had to get in an elevator with a couple of uh, this just drunk couple just blabbing on about the dumbest things and, and talking to me in the third person. Hey, he can hear everything we're saying. <laughs> yeah, you dummy, I'm standing right here. Yeah, yep. yep. And they were talking about some filthy, disgusting things yep. that I can't repeat. And I remember just hitting that button, like, come on, does this thing move any quicker? Mm -hmm. And they just think they're so cool. They just think that, they, that you know, they, they're just 10 feet tall and bulletproof, and you can just push them right over. <laughs> who hath babbling? They don't even make sense. You ever see anybody who's just so drunk they try to talk, and they go, you can't even tell what they're saying. Yeah. I've seen people talk, like, come to the, come to the door, knock on it. Blah, 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 blah. And they just literally pass out in front of me. Hit their head on the corner of the wall. Land on their butt and then smack their head on the back on the ground. I'm like, are you alive? You know? Did you just kill yourself in front of me? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? How did I get that wound? I don't remember getting, I don't remember getting in that fight. I, oh, you should have seen yourself last night. You should have seen what you did. did you, do you realize who it is you were talking to? Go to the biggest guy in the room and you're trying to pick a fight. Yeah, you're going to wake up and not, how did I get that wound? <laughs> that happens all the time. Who hath redness of eyes? You can tell who the drunk is, can't you? It's obvious. You see him a mile away. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. You say, well, you know, it says they that tarry at the wine. They that seek mixed wine. They're, they're there too long. This is just talking about people who drink too much. All right, well, you know what? If you want to get that literal with the verse in this chapter... Let's go to verse 31, and let's get literal. Look not upon the wine when it is red. Yep. So if you want to go drink your wine, you want to go drink your alcohol, that's fine. Just don't look at it. Go, go, go to uh, you know, wines, and, wines and, and more, whatever the place is. Go to your alcohol store. Go, to, go there and get your, get your alcohol. Just remember, we're taking the lens very literally now. So when you pull up, the first thing you need to do before you even go inside is get a blindfold and put it around your head so you can't see. Yep. Then go in there, find your favorite alcoholic beverage. Remember, blindfold on the whole time. And then go to the cashier and try to get there. And, and hopefully you pull out, hopefully you're going to pay by card. Because they're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a 20. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. You know, it's really the 100. They're going to give you some bad change. Because you're blindfold, remember, because the Bible says you can't look at it. So then take your alcohol and then put it, in a, you know, have them close. Close it in the bag so you can't see it. Go back to your car. And now you can take the blindfold off so now you can drive home, right? Because now you're not looking at it. Then when you get home, you know, make sure you don't drink it anywhere you have nice carpet. Because when you get that wine open, you've got to put that blindfold back on. And now you've got to pour that glass of wine and not look at it, all right? And then you've got to get to your lips and not look at it, right? Don't look at the wine. Look, the Bible's making the point here that if you shouldn't even look at it, what are you doing drinking it? Yep, that's right. That's the point. Don't even look at it. Look the other way. And if you're one who has a problem with alcohol in the past, if you're one who's been given a drink in the past, I highly recommend you make a practice of this. Yeah. When you go to the, when you go to the store to get something and, and it's you got to either go the long way or down the alcohol aisle, go the long way. Amen. Don't walk by it. When you see the beer commercial, click. When you see the the advertisement for the booze, look the other way. Don't look at it. <clears throat> look not upon the wine. What are the Give it the color in the cup when it moveth itself all right. Well, why not? Because we're just a bunch of fuddy-duddies. Because we're just a bunch of two, goody two-shoes. Because we're just a bunch of self-righteous people who just want to think we're better than everybody else. Is that why? No. no. Because at the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. What if, what if, what if we took that literally? Like, hey, we're, go ahead and drink your six-pack. Go ahead and drink your wine. Just stick your hand in the, snack, the sack of snakes when you're done and let it bite you. I think a lot of us would probably pass if every time we drunk we had to get bit by a snake. You'd probably be like, you'd be like, that'd be a good, you know, that, that's how, that's what the AA cup begins to be. You know, that's that'd be a good solution for them. You want to sober these guys up quick? 
You know, just have a snake at, on hand at all times, ready to just pounce on them anytime they, they take a sip of alcohol. They, they'll go weigh that out. Mm, yeah. You know, have a diamondback rattler just waiting to just take a big old chunk out of them every time they want to drink. It biteth like a serpent. It stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. I've said things drunk that I would, I, people who were to come, if you were to come in here and repeat things that I've said when I was under the influence of alcohol, I'd run screaming out of this room like a little girl. I'd never show my face again. It's that embarrassing. Mm -hmm. The things people do when they're not sober, yep. no. it's a shame. Right. You'll utter perverse things, you'll behold strange women. Yea, thou shalt be, and by the way, it says strange women, it doesn't mean, you know, the, the goth chick. It's just talking about a wife that isn't yours. Yep. That's what it's talking about. You'll go out and you'll commit adultery. You'll go out and you'll commit fornication when you're drunk. You're, you're a lot less inhibited to do things you would never otherwise do when you're drunk. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. I mean, can you imagine that? Just being in a, in a sea on the top of a ship's mast. And that's what it's like when you get drunk. You got, you got, your kids want to know, you get curious about what alcohol is like, what it's like when you get drunk, just go out to sea, okay, and climb up the mast of a ship and, and, and just have somebody go out in, this, in, a, in a storm. You know, or better yet, let's be more practical, go down to the playground and get on the merry-go-round mm -hmm. and just have dad or mom just spin that thing until you're just clutching on for dear life. And then get off, and that sensation where you can't walk and you're dizzy, yep. and you just fall on the ground, you, you just experience what it's like to be a drunk. That's what it is. Yep. Every kid in here is going, what's the, why then? Why would people want that? You know, if I, if I spin my kids around, my boy loves it, he'll lay on the floor and I'll just spin him on the floor like that. <laughs> and then he'll try to get up and walk. Well, he, he's a, he, of course he likes it because he's just a little boy, he's a dummy. He doesn't know any better. He's a child. That's what these people are like. They want to go out and get drunk and experience this. Right. Let me just go out and get drunk to the point that I can't walk. I really like that. It, that feels good. You're an idiot. Yeah. You're like a little two-year-old likes to get spun around on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> they have stricken me, thou don't say. I was not sick. They have beat me. I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. They have beat me and I felt it not. You know, that's, that, that's the classic bar fight right there. That's the, that's, that's the guy who gets drunk and thinks he can take on six guys in the room. Because <laughs> he can't feel anything. I've had friends like that. It's, they're, you know, they, they're the ones that wake up with bloody noses, black eyes, and broken bones. And they say, I felt it not. You will the next day. You'll, you'll feel it later. So we see, you know, I'm not going to rattle my cage too long here about alcohol but I wanted to preach this sermon because the fact is we are living in a nation of drunks That's right. and we're living in a culture that promotes the drinking of alcohol we're living in a nation where you know at least at least in the past you could say about St. Patty's Day at least it was quasi Christian at least it had some kind of religious connotation at least it was like something remotely wholesome I mean yeah it was a false gospel that St. Patrick was promoting but at least he wasn't going over there throwing beads on them, you know, and, 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 uh, and trying to get them drunk, you know, and dyeing the river green and drinking green beer. You know, that, was a, and, and that wasn't it. Yep. You know, at least it was somewhat wholesome, but today it's, it's descended way beyond that. Today it's not, they don't even know who St. Patrick is. Right. They don't even know why they're celebrating it. They just know it's another day. It's just an excuse for them to get drunk on a Sunday instead yep. of a Saturday. Right. right. Well, St. Patrick's Day, you know? I gotta wear green so nobody pinches me, and I gotta go out and get drunk because it's St. Patrick's Day. So that's the sermon this morning. And that's the warning about alcohol. It has real effects on real people, and that's why we need to stay as far away from it as possible. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for the stern warning from the Word of God that tells us about the dangers of alcohol, that we don't have to go out and find out for ourselves just how bad it really is. That we can listen to others who have suffered because of it, that we can go to your, your book and we can read it and we can see all these warnings and, and uh, of what it leads to and Lord even the actual physical effects of what it's like of being on top of a mast of being beaten and not, and not feeling it. Lord I pray that there would be a generation that rise up even in this room that can have that testimony that they have never once 
tasted alcohol. What a great testimony to have that they could spare themselves the sorrow and the suffering. And Lord, help us as parents, Lord, if, even if we have in the past been those that have drank, to, to raise up that generation and to be that godly example uh, of, of soberness and of righteousness. We ask in Christ's name, amen. 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 All right, well, we'll go ahead and sing one last song. Remember which one it is we're going to sing. We're going to sing song number uh, 183. <coughs> oh, how I love Jesus.